If you want, turn to Proverbs chapter 23. Today I want to ask you a question. And here's the question as you're turning to chapter 23. Who do you think you are? Just who do you think you are? You like that TV show? There is a TV show called Who Do You Think You Are? And it is kind of cool. They go back through people's history. It's with Ancestry.com. Some of you know I did the Ancestry.com thing and found out I'm, I'm an Englishman more than anything else. I, I thought with a name like Hacker, I would be more German, and I am probably 25% European in that you know part of Europe, Western European. But I'm actually more English than anything. I'm 43 or 41%. My wife and I both thought we would be other things. She's 43%. She's the Queen of England. And um, we both thought we'd find American Indian in us. We thought we would find Cherokee because we'd been told over and over and over throughout our, our lives that we had Cherokee relatives and there would be large amounts of Cherokee in us. And I had less than 1%, just a trace. And Lisa had absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing, which is how family things get going. I had a great, great grandma. They called her Cher Cherokee Burge. And if she really was a Cherokee, I would have had more than a trace. She was not. She just looked like an Indian, I guess. I don't know. That's what they called her. Anyway, Proverbs chapter 23, just part of one verse there. For as he thinks, oh, I didn't tell you which verse, did I? It's verse 7, just the first part of that verse. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. One version says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You are what you think. How many of you have heard you are what you eat? Well, there's a certain amount of truth to that too. But you are what you think. And as a man thinks, so he is. What, what, what that's referring to is the idea that you kind of become whatever you think. Um, my behavior is affected by what I believe about me. Your behavior is affected by what you believe about you. What you believe about you is sometimes affected by other things. Some of you have had things put on you. Some of you had parents that told you you couldn't do this or you couldn't do that or you could do this or you could do that. And depending on what you were told, sometimes you believed it. And that will affect what you do. It will affect how you function. I did not think, some of you know this story, that I could ever wear contact lenses. Did not think I could do it. I had watched my brother struggle trying to put contact lenses in in high school, and, and he couldn't, couldn't do it. He tried for six months, wore them, and tried to get used to them, and he would fill his, his little mirror with tears, overflowing, and, you know, it was just, it was horrible for him. And I watched that, and just talking about it used to make my eyes water. And then I decided that I wanted contact lenses. And I decided since I was writing a book on fear, I needed contact lenses to overcome my fear of touching my own eye. And now I touch my own eye quite frequently, and it doesn't bother me a bit. I just say that for you to relate to. Let me give you another one. I'll bet you this will affect several people in the room. In 2000, I decided that I was going to take my toothbrush and brush the back of my tongue. Because I heard on the radio that you would appreciate it if I did. <laughs> really. Because if you brush the back of your tongue vigorously, you get the sulfur that builds up back there off. And halitosis is strong in my family. And so, you know, there were times when I would pray for people. Some of you thought it was revival. It was really just my breath. Out they'd go. So I, I heard it, and I thought, I'm going to do that. That was not easy. How many of you have a really bad gag reflex thing? Okay, several of you, yeah. And I had a really, really bad gag reflex. It took me five years of doing it every day in spite of the fact that it just about gagged me and I wanted to hurl <laughs> and I would brush it <coughs> and Lisa would hear me in there coughing away and now 17 years later it's just part of what I do doesn't bother me a bit but it was not easy to overcome 
but I thought I couldn't. But I did. How many of you got anything? Has anybody got anything like that? Maybe you don't want to tell? Have you ever had something you thought, I could never do that, and then you turned around and you did it? Nope, everybody gave up. <laughs> yeah, no, we didn't try. How about this? Have you ever had a little child and you tried to give them some food and they wouldn't taste it, they wouldn't try it, they wouldn't even go for it, and then you tried again and they still wouldn't do it, and then they go to somebody else's house and somebody offers it to them and they take it and eat it, and they're just fine, and then they love it from then on. See, we all have these preconceived ideas sometimes. I thought I didn't like this. I thought I didn't like that. I could never eat this. I could never do that. Yeah, you got... Driving a stick shift. Driving a stick shift. I had to learn on one, but it's hard to do. It's so hard now. Now she loves it, but she... Well, the first time... Yeah, my wife, I tried to get her to drive stick shift, right? As we were getting married, and I made her cry. <laughs> and I gave up. And then she saw this little black car one year. And it was a stick shift. And she says, if you buy that car, I'll learn to drive stick shift. And she did. She was better at it than me. Yeah. And she hasn't had a stick shift to drive since. She could have driven my little Jetta diesel, but she said, no, that car stinks. It literally did. <laughs> a lot of us have had that I could never do that thing. But you can. Now, today, I want Tom to come. He's got a testimony. And I want Tom to share his testimony of what happened to him this last week. He did a thing on the internet. And um, come on, Tom. And I just want him to share what he did this week. Because it's, it's just way cool. So there's room up here for you to, you and I to stand together. And we got the widescreen picture. And all I have to do is get this thing to work. There we go. It was an interesting week. Uh, I, I was sending the word to someone that I've been speaking with for, I don't know, maybe over the last year. And uh, she is a, a teacher at a university in, in Iran, in, in Tehran. And she mentioned to me that as a child, when she was really, really little, that it was either her grandmother or her great-grandmother had dedicated her to Jesus. and that, this is a Muslim family. She, she, you know, she said she was a Muslim. And it's just, things just seem different. So I, I said, Lord, just let's see where this goes. It's, it's, I know this is all you. Uh, but things just seem different in our conversation. So I, I ask her a couple questions. And, and then I ask her, uh, would, you, would you like to ask Jesus in your heart? And, it, and, and the response was just, it was wonderful. It was just beautiful. Uh, so, so we did. I, I prayed. I typed out a prayer. And it's just really, really simple that the Lord would come and, and, and be, uh, that Jesus would come and be Lord of her life. And that she would surrender herself, her, her attitudes, just everything to him. And, and she, she was willing. And, and after I sent, sent it to her, she wrote back and she said, Amen. Thank you so much. And, and after that, she asked, uh, so what about punishment? Uh, because in, in her religion, in her background, in her culture, punishment is, uh, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, they're not taught that, that, that God is a loving God. Uh, and, and she said that that's one thing I've learned from you, that, that God really does love me. And I've never heard that before. And uh, so I said, I don't have time right now, but what I have to tell you is very good news. And, and the next day, I, I wrote back and, and I said, uh, uh, I told her about uh, John 1, 9, about how if, if we confess that, that he will forgive us. I told her about uh, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And there was another scripture which kind of slips my mind right now. But, but I told her, this is good news. There's nothing that, that you can do. You're not good enough to go to heaven on your own. But, but through Jesus' death on the cross, he gave you a free ticket. Heaven is yours. Amen. 
Isn't that cool? Come on, let's give the Lord praise for that. That is so awesome. Now, this is a rhetorical question. You do not have to respond with your hand up or anything like that. It's one of those things I just want you to think about what I'm asking. How many of you think you could do what Tom did? Some of you it'll be yes, and some of you will be like, I, I, don't, I don't know. Well, the truth of the matter is, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Some of you might be thinking, I, I probably could do it if I just knew how to type. Or if I just understood how Facebook functions. <laughs> it's not that hard, but some of you have no desire to get on Facebook. By the way, you might be blessed for that. Um, you know, it, it, it's just one of those things. Um, the reality is, you could probably do what Tom did. Probably not all of us will get an opportunity like he got. But it's an awesome thing when we do get an opportunity to let people know about the goodness of God. And all of us, every one of us, including me, I believe we're all capable of more than we're currently doing. Now, I'm not trying to put more on you just for putting more on you's sake. You know, I'm not trying to burden you with more responsibility, although responsibility is just your ability to respond. But responsibility isn't what I'm mostly interested in. I'm more interested in destiny than I am responsibility. Fulfilling the who and what of God created you to be. Being everything that he created you to be. Because there are times when people will tell you, you'll never be this, or you'll never be that, or you could never do this, or you could never do that. And if you believe that, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We can get stuck in those places of thinking, well, what Pastor Tim does, I could never do. I've got news for you. Anybody could do what I do. Not everybody will be asked to do what I do. But God can use anybody. I learned a long time ago, reading my Bible, there was this guy riding a donkey. And he was trying to go someplace, and the donkey had eyes to see, and he didn't have eyes to see. And he started whacking that donkey. Remember that story? His name's Balaam. And finally, the donkey spoke to him and preached to him. And if God can use a jackass to preach to that prophet, I'm sure he can use me. If God can talk through a donkey, he can talk through any one of you. And he probably wants to talk through you, and he probably wants to talk through you the way he talks to you and the way you are designed to speak. None of us is going to say it exactly the same. I am glad that Tom was where Tom was when Tom was there because God gave him the words that that woman needed to hear. But he probably did a better job of it than I might have done with that same person. Because there was some connection there. And by the way, how does Tom get these connections? Well, he's an artist. And a lot of these people that he connects to are artists. And they want to know what process he's doing with this and what process he's doing with that. And he shares that freely. And as he shares that freely, God opens up the doors for people to connect to him on that level. And that leads them to a connection on a spiritual level. So this has happened a lot. He's had a lot of opportunities to minister to people around the world who just happened to be interested in art. And it's kind of cool. Whatever it is that God's got you in the middle of, he can use whatever that is to speak to other people. And it's a really neat thing for you to step into that because there's a lot of joy in that. How many think Tom looked like that was fun when he talked about it? He didn't get up here and go, well, yeah. So I was on the Facebook page and... Talking to a woman in Iran, and she started asking me about Jesus, and oh, man. I had to share with her such a burden. Man, things God asked me to do. Uh. <laughs> no, there's a joy in him over that. There's, there's just something inside of you when you get to, to be part of touching someone's life. And by the way, that's why you're still alive. 
That's why you're still here. He needs you here or you'd be there. So if you're here, you have destiny yet on this planet. Things that he wants you to do, he'll leave breath in your lungs until he doesn't need you here and then he'll take you. That's a good deal. Hmm. So you are capable more of more than you think. I am capable of more than I think. So that means I need to change the way that I think. Amen? And that's why we do this, this gathering. Something I noticed interesting on Facebook this year, there, were, um, there was a clear divide in some of the posts that I saw on Facebook. You may have noticed it on your Facebook timeline. People you know who were completely opposite in who they were voting for than you. And you read their posts and it's kind of like, Ugh. I saw another one last night. Somebody's still mad because the wrong person won. <laughs> the thing is, I've been hearing a little bit of this on the news because I think the news people caught on to something. So maybe our, maybe our mainstream media caught on to something. They were so stunned that somebody won besides who they thought was going to win that they finally came to a revelation and that was this. They only run around with people who think like them. Well, we're guilty of it too, aren't we, a little bit? Yeah. And so it's really hard to change the way you think if you only hang around with people who think the way you think. This is yes. And it's okay for us to disagree about some things. We do disagree about some things. I'm right, but you haven't figured it out yet. But we do disagree about some things. <laughs> well, how many of you know I think I'm right because I've, nobody says, hey, I'm going to decide to think this way because I know it's wrong. Like, that's not a process you go through. You realize that, don't you? You're like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to think wrong because it's the good thing to do. We all try to think right. Just sometimes we think what we think is right, and it's not. And it's good for us. When we come together like this as the body of Christ, this is a big deal because we do rub elbows and shoulders with people who think differently than us, and that helps us. And, you know, quite honestly, I'm open to all sorts of people coming in and rubbing elbows and shoulders with us. And even more, I'm interested in us going out and rubbing elbows and shoulders with them so that we can all affect the way we think. But the most important thing is to put your mind in a place where God can affect the way you think. And then you'll think about you the way God wants you to think about you, which is what I'm trying to get to today. So who do you think you are? Does anybody here remember the old song? I'm a conqueror, victorious. I'm reigning with Jesus. I'm seated in heavenly places with him, with him. For the kingdom of God is within me. I know no defeat, only victory. For the kingdom of God is within me. I know no defeat, only strength and power. So we get to clap on the end. Yeah, came out of the Jesus movement days. We would declare who we were. That was not a bad thing. Not a bad thing to declare who God says you are. We used to sing that during the Jesus movement. Here's a, here's a verse that we used to sing during the Jesus movement. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Well, aren't you special? Yeah, peculiar in the King James. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That last little chorus I sang had that last line in it. Called you out of darkness into his light. God has called you something that you were not. He's changed you. He's transformed you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We used to sing that verse too. Or parts of that. And it was in a lot of songs. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. You know, you're not just a brand new man. A lot of people think this could be translated, you are a brand new species. 
Yeah, you are a completely different bugger than you used to be. <laughs> and you're from heaven. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. God loves you. Let's keep reading. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, in parentheses, for by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. You are seated in heavenly places with Jesus. That was in that first little chorus I sang too. You're seated in heavenly places. You are not where you used to be, what you used to be, or anything about what you used to be. You are something different. But do you see yourself as that? Do you get up in the morning and do what the devil does? You say, what do you mean by that? Well, when you get up in the morning, you know what he says, don't you? Oh, no. They're awake. You know the devil's afraid of you. The devil is afraid of you. He's hoping that you won't know that he's afraid of you. He's hoping that you won't understand that you are dangerous, that you are powerful, that you are completely different than you used to be. Well, Pastor Tim, I'm not different than I used to be. I still do dumb stuff. Yes, you're just a new species doing dumb stuff. But the more you realize that you're a new species, the less likelihood there is that you will do dumb stuff. See, when I start to realize who I am, I start to change what I do. I start to think like I'm supposed to think when I think about me as God calls me. I mean, he says, you're thinking about yourself too much. You think too highly of yourself. Isn't there something in the Bible about that? I'm glad you asked. For I say through the grace given to me, this is chapter 12 of Romans, verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Think about yourself the way God thinks about you. Don't worry about thinking too highly about yourself. If you think about the way God thinks about you, you won't think too highly. But what's really interesting about the word highly is the word highly actually means more self-focused than it does a high place in thinking. I know people who think about themselves all the time. They don't think about themselves nicely all the time. They think about themselves badly all the time. Anybody know anybody like that? They're always putting themselves down. They're always saying, oh, I'm a woe is me. I'm just such a not great person, you know. Beating themselves with their little whips, you know. Oh, I wasn't. You're thinking too highly of yourself if you act like that. You're thinking too much about yourself. See, the thing that we need to do is we need to think about who he says we are and then start doing what he says we can do. Because if I think about who he says I am, and if I believe I am who he says I am, then I will believe that I can do what he says I can do. If I fully believe that I am who he says I am, then I will fully believe that I can do what he says I can do. We've said this a lot of times over the years, but I'm not sure I'm getting it yet, so I'm going to keep repeating until I get it. If I believe I am who he says I am, then I will do what he says I can do. The verse before that last verse that I read in chapter 12 says this, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's why we get together. We get together so that we can encourage one another. The word encourage, oftentimes in the Bible, most of the time when you see the word encourage, it's literally to build up. To build up. And I'm going to talk about building maybe a little next week or in the weeks to come. But we need to get together and put those pieces in place that we will never get by ourselves. And that's why this, this thing right now that we're doing is valuable. That's why you ought to try the best you can while you're here to suck every ounce of this time out of this time. Because there's something here for you. There's something here while we're singing. There's something here while we're doing announcements. There's something here while we're shaking hands. There's something here afterwards. For some of us, there's something in the restaurant or in a meeting in the back or at home when we go take somebody back to our house. There's something there. There's something in all this that's extremely powerful. 
And we don't always realize how powerful it is. Have you ever run into somebody who thinks they're all that in a bag of chips? Some of you ladies, have you? that was mean. But it was funny. That's why everybody's laughing. Some of you ladies, have you ever met that guy who thinks he's all that? Yeah, that guy. That guy. Yeah. <laughs> How many of you? Um, don't, don't raise your hands. Rhetorical again. How many of you were that person? And yeah, you thought you were all that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The reality is that without, uh, without Jesus, you're just all that in a bag of shiitake mushrooms. You know what a mushroom is, don't you? You know about mushrooms? They grow them in places where it's dark, and they grow in manure. Did you know that? That's why you should always wash your mushrooms before you eat them. <laughs> yeah, I just messed mushrooms up on somebody's pizza forever, right there. Mushrooms are gone on my pizza, and never eating those again. Yeah, this tastes like, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, they grow in dark places, and they're kept, you know, and there are a lot of people who are deep in it. In the dark. But listen to what I'm saying. That's no longer you. That's no longer you. Because you've been taken out of darkness into the light. Come on. And you've got to walk around going, I am a child of the light. I carry the light within me. I am light for those who need light. I am light into every situation I walk into. I am light when I walk into Walmart. Next time you walk into Walmart, put your shoulders back and go, I am the light. <laughs> you are delightful. People need you to be delightful when they walk into Walmart and they walk in going, uh, they need somebody who's going, yeah, come on. Give me this day. I'm going to take the day. Seize the day. Grab it. Carpe diem. I'm going to go in and I'm going to do something. I don't know what. I think I told this last week, but I'm going to just tell it again. It was so good that God worked it out because I'm telling this teller at Walmart. She says, have a good day. And I said, it's impossible to miss it. See, that's not how I said it, though. I said it the way I normally say it, but for some reason I'm not remembering what I normally say. It's unavoidable. It's unavoidable. And she goes, what? And I says, oh, yeah. God made today, and it's a good day. And if somebody messes it up, it won't be God. So I need to just take this day and know that the day is good and not let anybody mess my day up. And she goes, that's really cool. And we got in a conversation, and I told her, that's what we teach at our church. I really need that. So I went out to the car, got a card as I was coming back in. We, we just happened to have Mike Van Scoter in the line. She, he was the only one. I said, yeah, this guy goes to my church. That may have messed it up. She didn't come after. <laughs> not sure. But he was smiling and I was smiling and she was just like, yeah, she's surrounded by the light. He was, he was, he was good. Do you know that girl? Did you you picked on her once or twice? She knows she's loved then. If Mike hasn't picked on you here. You know, you know, haven't been loved yet. So if he hasn't picked on you, just walk over to him and say, okay, where's my picking? Tell him that. <laughs> so now you literally are all that in a bag of chips. You really are. You are really amazing. Somebody says, oh, it's going to go to their heads. If you start talking like that, it's going to go to their heads. Let me tell you something about acting like real royalty. You may not be aware of this, but I've, I've not interacted with a lot of royalty, but I know a couple of people who have, and one of them told this very thing. He said, you know, nobility is the ability to be noble. Nobility is the ability to be noble. I know there have been some kings and queens in past history who weren't very noble. But there have been far more than sometimes we have recorded that were. 
Some kings understand that when you're a king, some queens understand that when you're a queen, that you're a leader. And you step into it, and you represent not just yourself, because it isn't all about you. You represent more than yourself. And when you understand that you represent more than yourself, then you put your shoulders back and you walk into a situation, not just what, for what you're going to do, but for what needs to be done for the nation, for the people. When you're a real nobility, then you know how to be noble. A real king is the first out in battle. A real king is the last one to get a morsel when there's hunger in his land. A real king knows how to be nobility. And God has called every one of you to nobility. You are all that. Not because of anything that you did, but because of what he did. And he established you. And when you're born into a royal family, you are what you are. And it's hard to avoid what you're supposed to be. But it's not a bad thing either. It's a joy to fulfill the destiny that you were born into. It's an honor. And when you understand how honored you are to carry what you carry inside of you, when I understand how honored I am to carry what I carry inside of me, I can walk into any store or any place and I can throw my head up and my shoulders back and I can say, hey, who do I need to bless today? And it might be just a simple smile. It might just be a simple greeting. It might just be the twinkle in your eye that they feel like somebody's alive when everything around them seems dead. And you are alive because you're a new creation. So, I am who he says I am. And I can do what he says I can do. I'm not aiming just for bigger attendance for this Wednesday night when I say this. But there were probably people when Mark was mentioning about the upcoming Wednesday night series, eight weeks on the prophetic. There were probably people sitting right here or maybe watching live streaming who thought, wow, prophetic. Yeah, there are certain people who have that and the rest of us are just pathetic. I want to tell you something. Every single one of you is called to be prophetic. That sense that Tom had when that woman from Tehran was saying what she was saying. That awareness that God probably wanted to say something to her. He probably didn't get back on there and thank God you didn't and went, Thus saith the Lord. Ha! Because she'd have thought you were a wackadoodle. And that would have been the end of your conversation. But he was prophetic. Let me remind you of what being prophetic is. Prophetic is being a normal Christian. Because the normal Christian can hear the voice of God. Can sense what God wants to do. If you are a normal Christian, you can sense what God wants to do. You can hear his voice. And as you begin to hear, get a sense of what God wants to do, you can walk over to somebody and you can repeat what you heard. I know last week I showed Sean Bolts calling out Polka Duck in a meeting in Australia where there was probably 500 to 1,000 people. Polka Duck. And he was even nervous about that. Does this mean anything to anybody? He had written it on his iPhone so he could like, he went, polka duck. I hope it means something to somebody. Because that's just weird. That is just as weird as it gets. Sometimes God will ask you to do weird things and you have to take risks. But here's the thing. He'll allow you to learn and build up. And by the way, sometimes weird things happen, but they turn out for the good. You've heard me tell this story, I think, but I still remember one of the great, great, great stories of what was going on out in the first vineyard church. What was the name of the guy who started vineyard? Wimber. Wimber. Wimber had an elder in his church, and the elder was sitting on the front row, and the elder jumps up on his seat, 
puts his hands under his arms and goes, at the end of the service, when they were getting ready to dismiss, cock-a-doodle-doo! 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 And then he sat down. Pentecostals. And everybody's looking at each other like, what the? What in the world was that? And all of a sudden, a voice from the back goes, it's me! And this guy comes running down the aisle, it's me, it's me! And John Wimber walks up to him and says, okay, what's you? I don't know. Tell me what just happened to you. He goes, I was at the back of the church. I was getting ready to walk out just to beat the crowd out the door. And he said, I just, I just thought, I just don't know if I can believe any of this. And he said, I, looked, I, I just remembered that story about Peter and how he denied Christ and the, the rooster crowed. And he said, if you just make the rooster crow, I'll, I'll believe. <laughs> how much do you think that guy sitting on the front row thought, oh, boy, I'm in trouble now? No one will ever forgive me for this stupid thing I'm doing. 1 Corinthians 14, 31 says, You can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged, built up. You can all prophesy. You can all prophesy. God wants you all to learn to hear his voice better, to gain your confidence in what you're hearing, and then to learn to repeat what it is he's speaking. And that may be anything from just smile at that person, hearing the voice of God just saying, just smile, to hi, to hey, God loves you. And this thing that we're doing with Sean Bolts is just that. It's just you hearing some of his stories and hearing some of his teaching to be better equipped to do more. Not to be burdened with more, but to be blessed with more. Not to be burdened with more, but to give, be given more opportunities. And we want to equip you. We want to see you equipped because I believe that God will build his church if we'll learn to build one another. So, I want to make it really clear to you. There isn't anything that anybody else has ever done for the kingdom of God that is outside of where he could and wants to take you. Oh, God's not calling me to raise the dead. What if he is? Well, God's not calling me to do this or that or the other. What if he is? Start where you are and let him take you where he wants you to be. I got crazy ideas. I think I'm supposed to fly. I've already seen time stand still in my own life. Can't explain it. Just a weird thing that happened. I haven't raised anybody from the dead yet, but I want to. I'd like to do crazy stuff like empty a hospital someday with a crew of people. And I don't think there's any time limit on, so maybe we'll just go empty a graveyard while we're at it. That'll mess with some of you. I don't know what I'm capable of because God can ask me to do something that I've never seen before. Well, it's not in the Bible. Yes, it is. If you've got any questions about it, I'll show you where it's at. You just come see me. So, well, I'll just tell you where it's at. Look the verse up yourself. It's John, I think, 14, verse 12. And the things that I do, you will do also and greater because I go to the Father. That covers it all, folks. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Because the more you think about who you think you are, the more clearly you understand who you are, the more joy and peace and victory and power you will walk in. Amen? Amen.